Jacob, who is Israel's most beloved son, his favorite son, who was sold away by his brethren. We know he takes an Egyptian wife and has half Egyptian children. So to this person that said, all the tribes are Jewish, everybody's Jewish. Well, what do you do with your matrilineal descent with these two children that are half Egyptian? We don't talk about, well, we, we don't talk about that. God forbid we should actually talk about that. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You can't play, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this doctrine, it works here, but when it doesn't work here, we'll make it something else. You're going to hear me talk about this. I've put this up here uh, in the table of the family tree, let's call it that, table of nations. You've heard me talk about Eber and how we get Hebrew, which is also in antiquity, Ibiru, Abiru. But I'll need to teach on this because we know that the people that were identified as Apiru are not one singular people, okay? And that gives credence to something else. If they're not one singular people, we may find that as you follow the line, we're only looking at this line from, from Eber down to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to show the children of Israel. But I've said to you that anything below this line, even though it bifurcates beyond, we'll call it the seed line, everything here could be Hebrew. Everything that stems underneath as Eber is at the top, and you might say, well, it doesn't follow the line, it doesn't matter. That's in your family tree. So when we talk about this, it's not a singular people either. Just like I tried to show you the problem of when we talk about the Hyksos. And there's a, there's a huge amount of confusion there as well. These are people that were in Egypt uh, in a period way before the children of Israel, uh, as we know them, were in Egypt's bondage, but yet they get conflated, okay? So there's a lot to sort out here. And we are looking at not just what makes Judaism, Judaism, what constitutes, who is a Jew, what is a Jew? Where does Judaism begin? And again, this is, this is based on fact, I'm not interested for the sake of presenting fact, I will have to tell you what some of the rabbis said and what some of the commentaries say, but we're interested in what's in the black and white of this book, period. So we'll also be looking at land, the promised land before, during the conquest, all the way to modern times, and this is complicated. And we need to learn this for several reasons. You're going to encounter some things which I'll point out today for example, in the book of Revelation. Remember, the last book of the New Testament that's written is written after the death of Christ. It is written while John is exiled on the Isle of Patmos, maybe somewhere between 90 and 100 AD. Okay? There are things in there that we will have to look at to understand for the end times. Who are these people being referred to? A lack of understanding of why some people are mentioned in Revelation will tell you that your, your scholarship for the earlier periods is inaccurate. So this is why it's important to get it right and to, to present it in such a light. So we have customs and traditions within Judaism that have their own story. They need to be told. I get that. But for example, I mentioned this uh, now probably a couple of weeks in a row and I'm going to show you today the subject of what's called matrilineal descent. You've all heard Jewish people will say if the mother's Jewish, the child is Jewish regardless of the father. If you go to their sacred writings outside of this book, and we'll talk about this as well, you are hard pressed to find any scriptural evidence to support this. So I'm okay if somebody says, yes, the rabbis made it up at this date, and we all agree that that's what happened, but please don't make that the absolute law of everything, because if you do, again, to the person who wrote this wonderful post on my site, you have a problem right away. And it's a glare, I don't need to get complicated. If the mother must be Jewish, and that's the way you're going to adhere, and there were no Jews 
at the time of the direct children of Israel, Jacob Israel, all of his children. There are no Jews. Sorry to tell you this, but there are no Jews yet. But we know that the two children, Joseph's children, Joseph, Jacob, who is Israel's most beloved son, his favorite son, who was sold away by his brethren. We know he takes an Egyptian wife and has half Egyptian children. So to this person that said, all the tribes are Jewish, everybody's Jewish. Well, what do you do with your matrilineal descent with these two children that are half Egyptian? We don't talk about, well, we, we don't talk about that. God forbid we should actually talk about that. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You can't play, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this doctrine, it works here, but when it doesn't work here, we'll make it something else. The whole Bible, the whole, Bi the whole Bible is written centered on Men, that was the time. I don't take offense at it. If, you take, if you're a woman and you take offense, you've got a problem. We're talking about how God ordered things. He ordered things by the Father. Just read the table of nations. Do you, if you have good eyes, you may see a couple of women in here in the wood pile. Okay? We included Dinah, for example, as the children of Israel because she's the only daughter that we know that's mentioned. But Dinah's not going to make a big impact in the big picture. There are other things that, because Dinah was there, affected other people in her family, if you know the story. But she is not important in the genealogies. Just, let's just get over that, okay? Let's get over being sensitive or you know, that's sexist or that's unfair. It is what it is. You don't get to pick and choose out of the Bible. And Adam begot Seth, and Seth begot, and read all the names. They, the genealogies are set up to be patrilineal, descendant of the father, mention of the father. And in the stories where we have a mother included, notice I didn't say genealogy, in stories, it is for the telling for our understanding, for points, for principles, to build our faith, to paint a picture for us. They're not important in that regard. But in terms of understanding, why is it that every geneal genealogical record, oh, it's the bulk of it. I'm going to say, I'm going to go so far as to say probably 95% of it is male. That's because that was what God was focused on. Yes, in the New Testament, you've got a person like Rahab, She's mentioned there in the genealogies to Christ as God was saying, hey, just as a sidebar, we're not all these holiness, uh, super self-righteous people. I picked a couple of real doozers in the woodpile to show you that God's grace is sufficient and that God is no respecter of person. If he sees the right in the heart and the faith in the heart, he will honor that regardless of where you came from or what you were doing when he found you. So I'm not interested in all of these kind of ideas, and they're romanticized or they're fantasies. Let's get to the facts. So you have a problem with this doctrine that is commonly, it's held everywhere. Now there was a, there was a meeting sometime in the 80s of rabbis. They were mostly all reformed or more, we'll call them, definitely not orthodox, okay? And they agreed at this meeting that for this branch of Judaism, because there are many different branches within, just like Protestantism, just like Christianity. They agreed, mother or father, it doesn't matter as long as one or the other is Jewish, and that if somebody converted to Judaism that was completely outside the pale, they wouldn't not honor their conversion, because that happens a lot within Orthodox, which is if you're not born, if you don't have a Jewish mother and a Jewish mother or two Jewish grandparents, eh, you're out. Okay. And I've never heard of such a thing, by the way, that, that your acceptance into a faith requires something you have no control over. That's brilliant, right? Anyway, okay, let's move on. So, uh, I, I can't control who my parents were. I just came out of the gate and they said, okay, and there you are, right? <laughs> All right. So we started tracing the biblical genealogy, and as I just stated, we passed through these, call them diverse personages. So you go down from Adam, you're looking at Noah. Noah has three sons. This son in the middle, Shem, everything that is below this line that stems from Shem are called Shemitic people, which became Semitic people, which was first only limited to language, but 
encompassed a larger umbrella of peoples from different territories as well. Okay? So we go from the Shemitic, which becomes a Semitic line. And again, to my listeners, please find a source to look this up. I don't invent things, okay? Somebody said, oh, I can't believe that. That's, that's the same connection. Okay, well, then everybody's lying about this then, okay? I don't know what to tell you. Um, we keep tracing, and as I pointed out to you, we find this man named Eber. And we know that that name is quite significant. Why? Because between Eber, Peleg, we have pretty much in the table of nations, we've got these breadcrumbs. Eber, we might say, are the people that crossed over the Great Divide. There are some names in there that if you translate them Hebrew to English, you can almost see a pattern crossing over the Divide, which is most likely how they came over from Mesopotamia, over the Tigris, or in those areas, and south. All right, so we have descendants of Shem, which encompass people, I've said, Arabs, Arameans, Assyrians, Hebrews, who speak a certain Semitic tongue. We find Eber, which brings us the Hebrew people, but at this point, and I'm going to keep repeating this, there is no and can be, please, I'm asking you please to listen to every single word I'm saying. There can be no Jews or Judaism. Minimally, we know that the word Jew comes from Judah, Yehuda, Yehudahite. So there is no way that Judaism existed prior to the birth of Judah, but it doesn't start with the birth of Judah. Judah is born, and if you read the history of that fourth son of Jacob Israel, you find it's quite colorful, okay? And then Jacob, before he dies, he basically pronounces most, some of them are blessings and some of them are just statements of fact uh, upon his children. So Judah is given a special blessing in that they will basically, the scepter shall not depart until Shiloh which for people who study the Bible know that basically from the tribe of Judah will be people who will be kings, who will reign, including the king of kings came out of that tribe. So there are certain things that we look at, as I said, breadcrumbs, but you cannot, I'm sorry, even if you don't understand what I'm saying, just the nomenclature of Jew, Judaism, Jewish, which are English words, the Hebrew, Yehuda. Yehudahite, even the, the name Judith is a cognate of Judah, but none of it, there is nothing above here that bears that nomenclature, that name. There's nothing above here that is some special celebration. So I open up a book that says, Abraham, Jew and friend of God. I'm sorry, that's what's driving me crazy. And then people just believe it. That's the Santa Claus of the Old Testament, I guess, and you just got to believe it, right? <laughs> now, I'm doing this really because it's, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can move on from here and go forward because that's what's frustrating is I, I'm having to review some of the most simplest bullet points here, which tells me I've either done a lousy job of communicating or some of you need to go out and buy some Q-tips. So, we know that Jew... Judaism, Jewishness, will not bear a, a distinct identity for many decades after Judah is born. Many decades. So I don't know how people process the stories of the Bible and how we understand them, but it's very simple. This man, Jacob Israel, who I keep saying that because I, I, I'm worried that if I start just saying Israel, there'll be people out there that imme immediately think it's the land. I'm talking about a man. His name was changed by God. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Your name shall not only be called Jacob, heel catcher, conniver, but Israel, a man or a prince that walks with God or God governed. You're going to go from what you were to what I say you are. Okay? So there's a name change there. And we know, for example, and I've covered this, Abraham came out of Ur of Chaldees. Look at Abraham. Abraham could not be a Jew. There is no Judaism. He can be a Hebrew. Yes, he absolutely can be a Hebrew. He could be a Semite. 
but he cannot be Jewish. It didn't exist. Good Lord. Okay. Hopefully, claro. See? Si? Yeah. Milagro. <laughs> que milagro. All right. So, the thing that I was alluding to is the fact that Jacob Israel and his whole family will go to Egypt. They will rediscover Joseph, the favorite son, who basically saves Egypt from famine. And this is where I want to keep going at this. We know it's very clear Joseph marries Asenath, has two children. Jacob Israel will adopt these children, take them as, as his own, and they will bear the name children of Israel, but they are half Egyptian and half children of Israel clan, if you want to call it that, Joseph. So right away there, right out the gate, you can't say, well, the Bible's completely matrilineal, mother descent. First of all, there was no Judaism at this time, but even if you were going to make the argument and say everybody was, I just showed you here are two half-heathen children. Okay, all right, so let's keep going. So we have uh, this problem, again, with the children of Israel moving into the land. And again, I, I really ask even for people who have been here for a long time, try and not make this one massive event. They went into Egypt and they were prosperous. They lived in the land of Goshen. They were prosperous. They had abundance. They lived like royalty. Remember, Joseph saved the land, so Pharaoh basically said, take what you want, it, until they became so populous. Now that would have taken a couple of generations. Even if you had banged out 10 kids at a pop per, per marriage, that'd take a while to become a very populous people. So don't make this timeline. They, they went to Egypt, the famine hit, then they were there enjoying the, the, the splendor that Joseph provided, and somehow you, you condense this all to a small window. It stretched out. And as I said, there may have been two exoduses because the Hyksos, which I believe may be actually, from what we know, there's good reason to believe that that is Jacob, Israel, and his first family. And then there is, and these Hyksos, it says, were driven out of the land. And we have, we have the record that says they died there. They died in that land. So maybe it's their offspring. I don't know. But what we do know is that suddenly a pharaoh is takes the throne in Egypt and sees these people are such a threat. There are so many of them. He says they could rise up and turn against us. So he puts them into hard labor and bondage. And if you remember, I said last week, pointing out that as the children of Israel were being delivered by Moses, we read in Exodus 12 that a mixed multitude joined to the people leaving Egypt. Now, along the way, the reason for pointing that out is because along the way you are going to find language. I'm not sure this was clear with you last week. You're going to find language, strangers, foreigners. If there's any stranger among you, if there's foreigners, for a male, for that male to partake of any rituals, of any exercises that seem spiritual in, na in nature, you must be circumcised. And it doesn't really give any express instructions for women strangers, but I guarantee you, there were women strangers. All you've got to do is look at Moses' wife. He marries Zipporah, who is Jethro, the priest of Midian's daughter. And we know that they were not part of this Hebrew band, if you will. They are basically traveling, wandering peoples of the desert. And they fit under, they could be Semitic people, but they fit under an Arab nomenclature. So that means that when Moses had Gershom and Eliezer, these are half Hebrew, half Arab. This is the point I'm trying to make this book. If you want to read it like you're reading, like a child might pass over and embellish and not pay attention to the details, you do that. But if you're interested in really putting the whole picture together, it is through this whole book you will uncover they did not separate themselves from the stranger. God said, don't take foreign wives or foreign husbands. And it wasn't because God was some weirdo. He didn't want them intermixing for one primary reason. The primary reason is not for the seed to remain pure. The primary reason is because God knew 
in a heathen universe, people worshiping pagan gods, the likelihood, the evil that's in us, we, are, we have a bent towards that, to be turned away from serving the living God, to serve these idols and worship and venerate them. Now that's really at the top of the list. Second to that may be that God wanted to preserve the line, for sure. But here's the problem. If you look at from when they come out of Egypt's bondage and follow their journey, we know that that first generation, God doesn't even let them into the promised land, except for Caleb. And I think there's just, it's a, it's a handful that will take the next generation in. But they are going to constantly be doing this, taking foreign wives, and I don't have to keep hitting this as hard as I do because all you've got to do is look at what brought about the destruction of the United Kingdom of Israel when it was under Saul, under David, and then the last king of the United Kingdom, Solomon. The kingdom split in 922 BC. Do you know why? Because Solomon had all of these women that God forbade, a thousand women in all. It means he didn't do too much kingly stuff. He did other stuff, but probably not the taking care of his kingly things. <laughs> okay, then. My point is that the prophecy pointed at Solomon was because of the evil that he had committed. You know, he didn't, he didn't rob God. He didn't steal God. He built a house for God, splendid gold and all of the beautiful trappings that we would walk into a building today and say, my God, look at the splendor of this all. But the heart of the man was turned away by foreign women. So there you go. It never stopped. And this is why the kingdoms got torn apart. There's a prophecy that says, the kingdoms will not be torn apart for your father David's sake. Because he was a man after God's own heart. You could say, well, but David did this and David did that. Yes, but David said... God said, David, a man after God's own heart. But you, Solomon, you've done it. The very thing I've been telling people from the beginning, don't do this, you did it. And what God warned that these would turn them away from serving him, they did. So once the kingdom is split into two parts, north and south, they will each have their own kings. And if you read the history of these kings, some of them are pretty evil. There's a couple of good ones in there, but some of them are pretty evil. Each one, north and south, will suffer the fate of exile or deportation and not at the same time. So you're going to have the northern kingdom be deported by the Assyrians, that final deportation. It was a string of these, but the final one occurs in 722 B.C. And these people that are in the north, all you've got to do if you've got a Bible like mine. So this is for the benefit of those folks out there who just cannot stop going, well, I, I don't believe that. First of all, just please take a look at a Bible map. I don't care if you're a Christian or a Jew. or I don't care what you are. Please just look at a map. Find any map anywhere that says Bible map. <laughs> I'm not asking you to look at the state of California. Bible map, holy <laughs> land. Here we go. So I want you to take a look at this. Everything that is this red line here, you see in it, we've got, this is Judah, this orange area, Simeon. There would have been a speckling of Levites here, okay? Eventually, we know that there, there's going to be people from other tribes, and we'll explain in a minute. They're stragglers. They're not full, full orb. And then from this line up, which encompasses Dan, Benjamin, Ephraim, keep going up. All of these people will be carried away by the Assyrians in 722. And we know that the bulk of these people are brought, deposited into buffer zones, and they will not return. Now, to the person who writes me on my post, I'm sorry, friend, where did all these people go? If you want to play your game that they're all Jews, there must be millions of Jews in the world. They were not adherents. Once they got carried over to the other side, they may have been carrying on certain sacrificial practices. They may have celebrated certain holidays, which over time, if you follow these people's wanderings, you will find breadcrumbs of what they formerly celebrated, which was not yet called Judaism. You'll find breadcrumbs on the steps of Russia with the, some of the Scythians, not all, the Sakasuni. You'll find breadcrumbs everywhere that either have the name of one of the children of Israel in such a way that if you read it like Sakasuni, sons of Isaac, 
where they couldn't distinguish the people and they generically called them something, they were referred to as Beit Humri, after King Omri, the people of Omri's land. So you've got to kind of open your mind a little bit that all of these people head over the mountains and they keep going. And we trace this in a series on the lost tribes that are not lost people and try to explain if you look at each and every one of these groups, for example, and I pick room because it comes to the top of my head real quickly. We know, for example, the people of the tribe of Reuben will make up in their wanderings. We will encounter these people as Frankish, French, in that general area deposited there, and they, know, they, they do not speak Hebrew or a Semitic. Their language even morphs as they go. You know, it's not like today where you pick up your phone and you do Google Translate or you have a help. You, in order to survive, to trade, to live, to survive, you must adapt, and that's what these people did. So when you find breadcrumbs, and when I say breadcrumbs of early Israelitish behavior and worship all the way in China, in antiquity, come back and talk to me. Are there actually, do we know that there were, and hear me out because I'm not conflating something, there were actually people identified as eventually Jewish in China, in antiquity. We know that. But if you look at and study those people, you find out that they, they, they themselves over time will not know who they are. They don't celebrate what you think they celebrate. It becomes almost this, this mess that evolves into something else. So what you have to look at when we're tracing these people is recognize that a a whole group of people, let's just pretend, I have a good pretend one for you, let's just pretend that all the illegal immigrants that came over our border in the last year just disappeared. And those same people reappeared, say, in a country like Iran. Would you go, oh, they can't be the same people? Well, maybe somebody was generous enough to buy them a one-way ticket. You don't know that. My point is you can't, if you're going to engage in this type of, oh, it can't be, then explain to me where all these other people who are migrating over the Caucasus and around the Zagros and around the Black Sea, tell me where they came from at the very same time that the final deportations occur in succession. We can follow these people. Their names, the places that they actually put down as towns that they reinvented, renamed the town after one of their, back in the ancestry pile, a name that would resemble ever so slightly. So I'm sorry, but no, not all Jews. And let me just cut to one thing here which will make perfect sense. And you go check this out for yourselves. I think I showed you a couple of weeks ago how in the King James, you're gonna find Jew, Jewish. For example, I believe it's in 2 Kings or 1 Kings, I can't remember which scripture it is. I showed you that that should not be labeled that way. It should read, the men of Judah or the Judahites, not Jews, because there are no Jews at that time. So just for the sake of conversation here, and so everybody can be clear and you can say, at least she got that out. Judaism will be a product or a byproduct as we know it. All the, the breadcrumbs that came before do not make up Judaism. What does make up Judaism is when they come back from exile, then it's perfectly clear. We can see it as clear as day. And I'm going to lead you through what happened so that you can put together the pieces and then go back in between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the intertestamental literature that we have available in Fiava Septuagint. Read it there. You will see what I'm talking about. And it all comes together and makes perfect sense. So the North gets deported. They do not. There's a, there's a small group that may have come back. Some of them stayed in that land, but most of them kept going. All right? Then you have the southern kingdom. This portion here, Judah, Simeon, and perhaps the bunch that was associated with Benjamin. We, there's a hard, a hard difficulty to identify whether they came along completely. Some of them did, some of them didn't, we don't know. With that being said, it was prophesied by Jeremiah, and Jeremiah 25 is the prophecy that then 
Daniel, when he's reading the prophecy, says, and that was prophesied. Seventy years into Babylon, the people would go. And I'm sorry, you don't get carried away in captivity for good behavior. That's like somebody saying, yeah, you know why the people are incarcerated? Because they were good citizens, right? It doesn't work that way. So God used the Assyrians and the Babylonians to mete out judgment for the people's failure to obey, both in seizing the land, which they didn't do, and intermarriage, which they kept doing. It's nonstop. Again, the kingdom was torn apart, literally because of Solomon's uh, many women turning him away. So you have a very small group of people that will return from Babylon. These are what will become the core, if you want, of what we would refer to today as Jews. Now, why do I say this? Because there's something that happens while they are in Babylon. And let me just go this way. When they come back to, to Judah, they don't come back to Judah. They come back to Judea, a Persian province. The kingdom is over. You know that, right? Well, there's too many people that think they came back and they autonomously started building. But if you read the books of Nehemiah, Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, you find out that there was a governorship over them. Sanballat, an arch enemy of Nehemiah, hinders the work. They don't want the work to go on. That was the governor of that land, no longer called Judah, but called Judea a Persian province. So, you know, here's another problem that I have. If you actually study there are plenty of uh, monographs and books on this. And some of them are so precise that you'd be like, wow, you want to read that? That's like you want to watch paint dry. Because the titles of them are like, you know, uh, settlements in the Bronze Age or whatever, uh, pottery. And you're like, oh, that sounds exciting, right? But it's through those works that we understand that when the people returned, what they returned to was part of 20 satrapies of the Achaemenid Empire, Judea would be under a governorship. And this, as I said, points us right back to Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and eventually Esther. In Babylon, it's very clear that something happened to the people. Remember, in Babylon, it's the southern people. These southern people, when they come back, although they may remember what tribe they might have been affiliated with, they come back more conglomerated identifying more, no matter where you came from, as Judah. And they come back to Judea, but they begin to identify no longer tribal per se, although they will keep that identity when they come back as a people. That's where you see the emergence of something else. You know, you read in your New Testament about the Pharisees. You ever wonder where they come from? Are they just uh, magic people? They just appeared in the New Testament? Phariseeism the name Pharisee is sect, separatist, or heresy. These were not priest, priest people, but they were affluent people. But before they became known as Pharisees, these are the people that when they returned from Babylon and the law was read, you remember what happened? The law was read, the Feast of Tabernacles was coming up, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles with super zeal, right? They were like so committed. And immediately after Tabernacles, this is from the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, they fasted to repent, an act of contrition. And there's a, a, a place in one of those books that whatever, whatever God's word says, that we shall do. Religious zeal, and specifically in the form which will morph into Judaism, takes place right there. So you've got a group of people that come back. Pharisees are not yet established. And by the way, Pharisees did not call themselves Pharisees. That name was given to people who were not Pharisees. They looked at them and said, oh, but you're separatist here. And that name stuck to them. Josephus was a separatist, a Pharisee. But he never calls himself that. Somebody writing of him says he was. It was not a good title if you were in a different crowd. So what you have are people that will begin to say, we will keep the law, no matter what, we'll keep the law. Well, that's good, except we know one problem, no one can keep the law. No one can. 
they become religious zealots that morph into Phariseeism. And Pharise Phariseeism will take its launching pad and become what we know it from the New Testament in the Hasmonean period of Israel. So why do I bring that up? Because the religious zeal couldn't last. You remember last week I left off with the reading in, I believe in Nehemiah, it was either Ezra or Nehemiah, showing you how you've got a list of what I call the perpetrators that married foreign wives and the thing was, we'll put them away, we'll divorce them, we'll get rid of them. Of course, you know, that's brilliant, so you have kids now, what do you do with the kids? But anyway, okay, that's all great and moral, it sounds great and moral, right? We'll, put, we'll, we'll just get divorced and we'll start all over and it'll be like nothing happened, right? It's great thinking right there. So why I bring this up is because they all said, yes, we will keep the law, we will put away our wives, but we know what happened. Nehemiah is recalled to Susa, and we have good evidence to show that they went right back at it again, and they started intermarrying again, and they were not keeping the law, and the religious zeal amongst that community waned. It started to wane, so you've got a separation now between the zealots, the religious zealots who have become known as the Pharisees, and the people that said, we will do thus and so, but they couldn't keep their vow. Now, I want to show you something else, because this is part of showing a problem that we will address in upcoming messages. So if you turn to Nehemiah 9, I want to show you something that's quite problematic. For all those people that say, and the people lived in the land, and it was their land, and we argue about whose land is it anyway, I want you to look at Nehemiah 9, And verse 36, your King James says, Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. If you read the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is obed, which is slaves. They came back, and we tend to paint the picture romantically that they did all this and they were free people. No, they were not free people. They were still under Persian control, and that would remain so for about the space of 200 years until Alexander the Great in 332 conquered the then known world. He conquered Israel, what we call Israel, Egypt, and Syria. And then it was occupied for a small space by Alexander until he died. And then you've got his generals who argued bitter, bitterly over who would get what. So between the Seleucid and the Ptolemies, the Ptolemies in Egypt, the Seleucids, they split everything up into four parts, four generals, took their territory. So then it, it basically went under a Hellenistic rule for a time. And if you keep following the history from the point I just told you, they came back, it's a Persian province of Judea, no longer Judah. Then we have Alexander the Great, then his generals, and then the crowning one will be um, the Roman general who basically walks in 36, 37 BC, Pompey, and claims the land for Rome. The occupation of that land will go on. So from, uh, just hear me out, from the time they came into the land, which you encounter that, say, in the books of Joshua and Judges, till the time they come back, whatever that timeline is. Let's just hypothesize. Let's say it's less, it is certainly less than a thousand years. Or maybe it might be seven or eight hundred years. I didn't do the math, it's just. That's as long as they literally occupied the land and in disobedience at that because they didn't clean the land, even though Nehemiah, they'll read and they'll say, yes, and they drove out the people. They didn't, we have the record, they did not drive out the people, they intermarried. So let's say they were in the land for seven or 800 years, but prior to that, there were people living there. And after that period, it will be occupied from the time they come back. That timeline is 5, 538. So from, from the return, 538 B.C., all the way until 1920, when it was under British mandate. Five, I'm sorry, 538, I think. 
to the British mandate of 1920. They didn't occupy or own the land or claim the land. So you tell me when, and I'm just going to put this out there, and you can, you can think about this. God said that's the land, but there, there are requirements to take it. They didn't meet those requirements. They acted in disobedience. God was like, okay, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost, I'm done. And then the land will be occupied. Persians have it. A whole successive wave. The Mamluks, the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim conquest. There was a time. The Crusaders occupied Jerusalem for a time. A very short period. But if you look at the history, it is impossible for anybody in this modern age, I'm, I'm against terrorism, but it's impossible to make a claim about anything when the history of this land is so muddled to begin with. You know, I want you to step outside of all the political and all the religious, and I want you to think of this country for a minute. We have documented that before the British and before the French, there were other people here. Read uh, Barry Fell's book, America BC, there were other people here. Other people settled this land, and if you want to say, but they didn't last or they didn't stay, people automatically say, oh, the, the American Indian was here. There are people other than the American Indians here too. And then suddenly, America is birthed, right? Da, 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 right? And we could just forget about anybody who ever set foot on this land. So if we can form America and say this is the United States of America and have blatant disregard, because most people don't know who was here before the Indians were, if we can have blatant disregard for that, why can't we have blatant disregard for people who actually disobeyed God, never actually committed to what God said they need to do to claim the land, and then let's make matters worse. I'm not going to hear this anymore, that the land belongs to the chosen people. Why? Because the chosen people, part of the chosen people, are those scattered to the wind. That includes people sitting in the sound of my voice. You don't know where you came from, probably. You got an ancestry test. You might be from Ireland or from Russia or from... But somewhere back in your woodpile, the likelihood that you are part of one of the scattered peoples makes you a chosen person. The, the northern people are just as chosen as the southern people, and not all of the south became Jews. Paul even says not all Israel is Israel. So why are we having these, what I'd call, man-made, engineered debates, when the book actually, although it's not a perfectly delineated concept, it shows you how muddled this is. Can anybody in the sound of my voice tell me this is cut and dry? So God said it, and, and, and then that's that. Well, that would be so if the people said, yes, sir, went into the land, did exactly what God said, and then said, see, sir, we obeyed your orders. Now what's next? And you probably would have blessed them. But they didn't do it. Now, let me back up to one last thing, because I'm already out of time here. So when they came back from Babylon, they were in a settlement, remember it's Persian Empire, settlement of no more than 30 at best, 30 settlements in a radius of just a few square miles. Did you hear what I just said? They came back, I'm going to go again with the map. And when they came back, they came back to an area that was just the radius of a few square miles, not the whole land. So now you've got other problems. I'm just going to put them out there, and we can try and address them next week. In Nehemiah and Ezra, you know who's called out? The priests, the Levites, the people who were supposed to be the teachers of the law. They were the worst offenders. Now, when you have corrupt teachers, Corruption flows down. This is why the church world is suffering. Well, I'm sorry, I'm just going to do it. I have time to do it. I don't, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is why the church is suffering. You have people, and I'm sorry, you know, it might be really good, committed people that are pastoring churches and doing whatever they think they're doing, but they're not doing any favors to anybody. 
if they are not giving instruction. We are morally destitute in America. Why? Because there's no more instruction given. People are not reading the Bible or it's not being taught. People would rather go to the easy things. As I said, feel good, good music, happy times, good coffee shop, entertainment. But God forbid we should actually say we need to get back to digging our heels in and learning. Because from this, we glean a lot, including the fact that if you are so inclined to, by the way, you can begin to see why I get very animated on this subject. Because everybody wants to say, well, I, I know the this is the history. Go on blog sites. Any of you commented on a post you saw somewhere where it said Moses, Moses was a Jew? Moshe. No, my problem is no one thinks outside the box. His name was Moses. Don't you think it's ironic that several pharaohs have the name Moses in their name? Thut Moses, Am Moses. It's not necessarily, you could say, well, but that they named the child that. No. Be very careful and read the story again. Who named the child? Okay? These are things that we just conveniently gloss over and we don't think about them. And they affect a lot when you recognize, I go back to this matrilineal mother descent problem. It will affect a lot because if you know the history of what's behind here, you also know that in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell, there was a mass massacre that happened. 73 AD, the people barricade themselves at Masada and it's a mass massacre. People are expulsed from the land, Jews, now practicing Jews, at 70 AD, and they are referred to that and called as such by that time, are expulsed or killed if they don't leave. So I'm going to ask you a question. There's nothing in this book, nothing, that says the mother must be of whatever, nothing. So where did this come from? And I'm going to introduce something which I will take up again next. I didn't even get to my message. I'm sorry, guys. But here's what will be birthed out of this. In the second century, oral traditions of Judaism will be written down, called the Mishnah. And 400, 350 to 400 AD, the Jerusalem Talmud, and following that 500 AD, the Babylonian Talmud. These will be commentaries, discussions, and debates that rabbis had on the social, moral. They're broken down into categories. The Mishnah actually has 62 or 63 tractates, divisions, and in those divisions, there are subheaders like uh, the religious life or how to deal in business, to abide under the banner of the, of the law. So even when I turn to the Mishnah and the Talmud, now we're into rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism starts at about the second century AD. I'm looking in that material and I can find no justification, no information. It all points to one or two scriptures that cannot validate the mother must be. So this is a late doctrine that was made up, but every Jew that you ask today would say, oh, the mother has got to be Jewish in order for the child to be Jewish. I would ask you to consider something. If that came about because people fleeing Jerusalem, exiled, exiled people, people that died, who do you think were slaughtered first, the men or the women? Mm-hmm. And it was a mass slaughter. Not, we're not talking about a small number of people. Now there are fewer women left, but there are fewer, much fewer men. Why not flip it? So as long as the women who are still populous can produce children, they will be Jews. And you might say, well, well, they didn't come up with that for that reason. Well, you tell me why circumcision was performed on the man. You say, well, they don't have the same body parts in our generation, maybe they do, but back then they did not. So why did God cho chose to speak to the man and say, you must be circumcised? And why did, why even the sin from the line of Judah, why the sin of Onan is brought today to the state? It's all male-centric. There's no, I have no issue with that. But then you can't have it both ways. You can't say, and I could, if I had the time here, I'd catalog to you all of the half-Hebrew, half-Israelite, part pagan, 
part Arab, part something else, that descend in lines that you'd say, and these are people that took the throne that reigned in Israel, that required you to be of a certain lineage, and yet mixed people are leading the charge. There's a whole mixed bag of people. Rahab was not a good person in the Bible, but we don't hear that she's a, an Israelitish woman. She's a pagan and yet she makes it into our genealogies. My point is, you can't have it both ways and say, well, yes, these are the same people that are going to parse every, every part of the sentence, but when it comes to noticing, oh, Ephraim and Manasseh, they're, 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 half, they're half what? Oh, no, no, that, they're, they're, they're Israelites, and, and therefore, because they're Israelites, they must be Jewish. Do you understand why I'm saying what I'm saying? It's not to hate, it's not to... Uh, say something degenerates to show that you can't have it both ways. It either is all this or all that. But if you're looking at this history, you see it's very mingled. The people are mingled, and that was the sin that basically God had had enough of. Now, if uh, somebody wants to twist my words for today, go ahead. But I think it's abundantly clear. The point is you can't make a doctrine hundreds of years later and be dogmatic about it and say that's that when the history of a people that's recorded in this book, and I don't want to hear about somebody's oral tradition. I've got an oral tradition, that's why I use a toothbrush. I don't want to hear about somebody's oral tradition because what's written in this book is what's going to matter first and foremost to anybody, Jew or Christian. And the only thing I find that the rabbis pointed to, they point to a passage that talks about if you have a slave woman that marries a slave man because the slaves belong to the master. And somehow they extrapolate from that because that passage suggests that it's okay with the master, that somehow that's the matrilineal passage. Or Deuteronomy 7, which says just don't, don't marry your sons to these daughters or vice versa. There is no... There's no backing it up. Now, if you told me, if you were just honest about it and you said to me, this is, this is what we do in our religion, and there's no, there's no scripture for it, but this is what we've decided, and you're honest and upfront about it, and you can just tell me that, I'm good with it. But you know how many people walk around? We always only hear the story of somebody saying, oh, my mom's Jewish, so therefore, blah, blah, blah. But you know how many people walk around who actually have a reverse problem? They desire to be Jewish, and everybody has a prerogative and a right. They desire to be Jewish, but the mother wasn't Jewish. The father was. Now imagine how crazy this is. I'm sorry, but basic biology, doesn't it take two people to make a baby? That means seed of one and seed of the other got to talk to each other, right? And hey, how's it going? Okay, we get together. Now we're one, right? Which means so you're going to have an argument over which seed is going to be the seed that we look at when this whole book, you tell me, what about the great king, what was her name? <laughs> what about the great leader, what was her name? What about the woman who mothered a whole tribe, what was her name? I don't, I'm not finding it. Now, I don't want you to think I'm sexist. I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to be honest. And when you're looking at it that way, you have to stand back and say, somebody did something for another reason. This doctrine came about for another reason, not simply because that's the way it was. Oh, well, Eve was the mother of all living things. There, there's one for you. I'm sorry. That still doesn't spell it out. You want to have a doctrine, you better be able to back it up. So why would this matter? Because in the big scheme of things, God basically said to your seed, that seed went through Isaac, it went through Jacob, it went through Judah, bringing us to the time of Christ. And even there, wow, you got to just stand back and go, wait a minute. If Mary, the mother of Jesus, is just a holy incubator and they never did the deed, and the claim is that Jesus was a Jew, what on earth do you do with that? Oh, gosh, let's not even go there, right? Do you get what I'm saying? Because there was no consummation of the marriage. Did you just hear what I just said? Yes. 
because that would flag a big problem for anybody who's going to buy into this doctrine. By that virtue, we know that Jesus was all man and all God at the same time, but by that virtue, th I want you to really think about this. Because if you use that logic, they never had intercourse to produce the child, which means her seed never entered into that child. So while they hung a sign above his head, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, by their own terminology, he couldn't be. Now, I believe he was, because I don't think all, I think all this is nonsense and made up, and I'm not meaning to offend my Jewish friends. I'm just telling you, this is the book. Do we not Jews use the Old Testament? What is in this book that suggests that? Nothing. Okay, so if you're interested in all why this should matter to you and the rest of all of this crazy stuff, come back next week. I'm out of time. That's my message. <laughs> Folks, if I, appear, if I appear frustrated, it's because I am. Because I'm so trying to sort this out with there are no agendas here. I cannot repeat this enough. I'm so trying to sort this out to show you. We have the same thing in, in Christianity. That's why I spent weeks on traditions that make void the word of God. Call no man father, yet this is what the Catholics do. To the Protestants, we are not here in this church, but many Protestants succumb to that whole name it and claim it thing, which is a corruption, a perversion, the prosperity doctrine. The, um, you know, I could keep going. Every religion has these, but the ones that affect us, we should look at. We should better understand that maybe the people that we think identify as something are really not what they are. And maybe the people we never thought in a million years are, you find out, wow, that's a mind blow right there. In fact, I'd strongly encourage anyone who's in the sound of my voice to read the Apostle Paul's writing out of Romans 9 through 11, which basically tells you in a nutshell when he explained this, and he was a Jew, and he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was a Pharisee, and he explains it so perfectly. We are not to hate on our brothers and sisters because they will be grafted back in. That's the whole point. I started off talking about the two sticks out of Ezekiel, Judah and Israel, the north and the south, the peoples of the world versus the people who settled in that land who identify as true Jews. Do I make a distinction? Yes, because of what's in the book of Revelation. You ever read the book of Revelation where it says, those who say they are Jews or are not, or the synagogue of Satan? There is a reason why John wrote that. To understand that, you've got to understand all of what comes before. And to the people who like to try and make it something um, where we're attacking people, we're not putting together a correct picture of who we might be, where we came from, and who we will encounter in the future. To me, it's pretty important. I want to know. So if you're not interested, don't come back next week. If you want to know, be here. That's my message. Good day, folks. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.